Federal State Institution Sochi National Park of the Ministry of Natural Resources of Russia presents a film by Umar Semyonov. Caucasian Leopard, The Return of the Legend. The development of human society has always been done at the expense of ever-increasing pressure on nature. In the 21st century, the impact on the Earth's natural ecosystems has been unprecedented and has led to the disappearance of animals, plants and fungi. Rare and endangered species are the most vulnerable and without doubt require immediate human involvement in their rescue. In this film, We'll talk about how people affect the life, or rather, the survival of the leopard, one of the brightest representatives of the cat family. It's believed that the leopard formed as a species approximately 470 to 825,000 years ago on the African continent. Its Asian line arose as a result of the predator developing new territories much later and dates back to 170 to 300,000 years ago. Thus, representatives of the genus Panthera, which originated in humid and warm climates, have been on a long evolutionary path and in the process of these changes have developed amazing adaptation mechanisms that allowed them to populate large areas. The species' broad ecological plasticity allows it to exist successfully in the harsh ecosystems of the northern part of its habitat in Asia, in the highlands of Africa and the Himalayas, and to survive in extremely hot and dry climates, typical for deserts such as the Sinai, the Arabian, the Namib, Kalahari, and the northern Sahara. Over time, the study of the leopard has described and identified 29 subspecies, but DNA analyses of individuals from the predator's different habitats carried out in the 21st century made it possible to combine some of them. To date, nine subspecies of the leopard have been established by the scientific community. Sudanese or African leopard, Arabian leopard, Western Asian or Caucasian leopard, Indian leopard, Sri Lankan or Ceylon leopard, Indo-Chinese leopard, North Chinese leopard, Far Eastern or Amur leopard, Javanese leopard. Across its entire habitat, with its variety of climatic, biotopic and competitive conditions, the leopard has shown amazing and sometimes incredible ability to adapt to the conditions of a dynamic environment. Living in the same territory as the tiger in Asia, and with lions and crocodiles in Africa, the leopard is a successful hunter, competing with stronger and larger rivals, and single-handedly confronts packs of spotted hyenas, wolves, and wild dogs. It's only anthropogenic pressure that's become an insurmountable barrier for this amazing predator. Over the past 100 years, the leopard's habitat has shrunk drastically. Its numbers in many places have decreased critically, and in some places, it has already disappeared completely. Below me, the silver-capped Caucasus lies. A stream at my feet rushes, foaming and roaring. I watch a lone eagle over the peaks calmly soaring, drift near as he motionless circles the skies. Here rivers are born that tear mountain asunder, and landslides begin with a crash as of thunder. Here float solemn storm clouds, and through them cascade swift torrents of water. They plunge over the edges of great naked cliffs, and spill down to the ledges that patches of moss and dry brushwood invade. 
The nature of the Caucasus is truly amazing and sometimes astonishing. Just imagine, back in the days when the poet wrote this, one of the most common inhabitants of the Caucasus was the leopard. Yes, you heard that right. The Caucasian leopard. Until the mid-19th century, the leopard, known under various names, leopard, panther, kaplan, was so widely spread that it could be seen everywhere. One of the first encounters with leopards that proved their presence in the northwestern Caucasus was documented shortly after Karachai's annexation to Russia. In 1870, Nikolai Petrusevich, a member of the Russian Geographical Society, published an article entitled Fighting the Leopard, in which he described the case of a leopard entering a highlander's stable in the isolated terrain of the Chilmas, not far from the highland village of Uchkulan. The explorer wrote, leopards are known to populate both slopes of the Caucasus Ridge, almost along its entire range. It's also an established fact that leopards are so strong that they sometimes sneak into stables to take goats and sheep. To strengthen their ties with the Highlanders, the local authorities organized special fairs, where the local population brought their products for sale and exchange, and all transactions were recorded. In this regard, the entry made on April the 23rd, 1848, at the fair in Batalpashinskaya village, now the city of Cherkesk, in Karachai, Cherkesia, is quite remarkable. It states that the highlanders from the Uchkulan Gorge traded five leopard skins. And two years later, at a similar fair in the same village, as many as 10 leopard skins were offered for sale. A leopard skin was typically sold at a cost 20 times higher than those of bears and wolves. Famous naturalist and expert on the flora and fauna of the North Caucasus, Nikolai Dinik, said this about particular areas of the leopard's habitat. The panther Felis pardus L isn't that rare in the upper reaches of the rivers Belaya, Balshaya, and Malaya Laba, and in other mountainous areas of the Kuban region. It's likely it spreads to the northwestern end of the main Caucasian ridge, to Anapa, where the forests covering the Caucasus mountains end who could come face to face with it on the outskirts of Twapse. Over the next 100 years, the relationship between man and leopard in the Caucasus didn't favor the latter. By 1905 and 1906, not a single leopard was hunted, although the predator could still be found in the northwestern Caucasus until the middle of the 19th century. Its numbers were steadily declining. Overhunting of the leopard in the greater Caucasus region led to disastrous results. By the end of the 19th century, the leopard population had decreased drastically and couldn't be restored naturally. The species was doomed to complete extinction in Russia. Under the circumstances, reintroduction remained the last and only possible way to resuscitate an independent and viable leopard population in the Caucasus. Reintroduction involves territorial colonization by a species that once lived there but disappeared for some reason. In the case of the Caucasian leopard, the reason is clear, man, who is now trying to save the species from complete extinction. A group of scientists supported by the World Wildlife Fund developed a unique restoration program, at the heart of which is the Center for the Restoration of the Leopard in the Caucasus. It is a truly unique center. There has never been anything like it in the world. We were doing a very big and worthy thing, right before the Olympics, as you know. We've talked about it many times. In the 50s, leopards were completely exterminated here in the Caucasus, completely by poachers. And with the Olympics now in the pipeline, we agreed that we should restore the population. This is very complex, truly delicate work, 
I think you've heard the experts describe how it goes. Interesting in my opinion, and very promising. We look at it like this. Our Olympics in Sochi is essentially connected with bringing lost nature back to life. The first leopards to form the center's breeding stock were obtained thanks to the direct participation of the president of Russia. Our task, which we decided with the center's head, Uma Albakirovich, is to reach 50 individual leopards to be sent into the wild. It is important that the center properly welcomes leopards, ensures their safety, and provides full medical assistance and scientific support. The Center for the Restoration of the Leopard in the Caucasus was built in record time as a part of the Sochi 2014 Olympics infrastructure, the starting point for the practical implementation of a complex program for reintroducing the rare predator. The Center's task was defined as follows. The formation of pairs, taking into account the genetic lines of predators, obtaining offspring, preparing them for independent life in the natural environment and release into the wild. The center's long-term goal is to create an effective methodology for keeping and training leopards, to form stable groups in places of release into the wild, that's to say, its historical habitat in the Russian part of the Caucasus. In September 2009, two males from the wilds of Turkmenistan, Alus and General, were brought to the center. Six months later, under the Amur Tiger Exchange Program, two more females, Mino and Cherry, were delivered from Iran. We never refused to cooperate with other nations, and this center was launched with the help of countries like Iran and Turkmenistan. They donated the first individuals. Most importantly, these individuals should preferably be from the wild, because those that come to the center from zoos, unfortunately, their offspring don't have the necessary survival instincts and training that a cat needs to survive in the wild. In 2012, the International Union for Conservation of Nature and the European Association of Zoos and Aquariums supported the Russian program for the restoration of the leopard in the Caucasus. Following an agreement between the Russian Ministry of Natural Resources and these organizations, a male, Zadig, and a female, Andrea, were brought to the center from Lisbon Zoo. And so, a new page was opened in the history of the leopard in the Caucasus. It first seemed that all conditions for success were at hand, but what looked simple on paper turned out to be a much more difficult task in reality. There were no other centers in the world working with such large predators as the leopard, so the team had to learn everything the hard way, through daily work. Strategic mistakes made in the design and construction of the center's infrastructure, lack of practical algorithms, and methodology of working with large predators made it very difficult to cope with the tasks that were set immediately after opening. So the hard daily work of rebuilding infrastructure and setting up proper algorithms for working with leopards began. Training methods were created experimentally what became the main motto of the center is now known as the principle of artificial stimulation of natural instincts. The center has come a long and difficult way in the setting up and fine tuning of a totally new infrastructure, forming pairs, getting offspring, and preparing them for independent life in the natural environment. Watching, recording, and analyzing leopards' behavior for long hours and days and months, the center's staff has developed new elements of environmental enrichment for the artificial formation of hunting reactions in kittens in the early stages of development. For more than 10 years, this process has continued to be improved and fine-tuned. During this time, more than 80% of the center's infrastructure has been changed and modernized, 
Practice shows that infrastructure, adapted and thought out scrupulously, is key to the implementation of basic techniques and working methods to prepare leopards for independent life in the wild. The center is actually an open-air scientific laboratory for studying leopards' behavior. It needs constant attention, care, and development, and this is only possible for the dedicated. Today, the center operates according to the highest international standards, which few countries can reach. Most don't have similar practices. Cooperation with the Russian Academy of Sciences definitely shows that the methods for training the animal before being released into the wild and then evaluated for three to six years afterwards are correct. Leopard females reach sexual maturity at three to four years of age, but may start mating later. At the same time, not all females participate in reproduction, and not all mating leads to pregnancy. That's probably the reason why, in the wild, a new male can push out an existing one and mate with a female. For her, the possibility of mating with different males is a kind of ecological insurance for the species. This is how the cycles of natural processes are worked out. To achieve the program's goals, the center must adhere to the artificial formation of pairs, taking into account the genetic lines of specific individuals, the offspring of which are distributed over different release sites within the historical habitat in the south of Russia. This minimizes the risks of inbreeding among the center's graduates. This is achieved by a rigorous analysis of individuals' origins, as outlined in the International Stud Book of the Persian Leopard. So, the center forms pairs taking into account recommendations of colleagues from the European Association of Zoos and Aquariums and the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Of particular value to the program were wild individuals brought to the center with the assistance of Russian President Vladimir Putin. There were four such predators originally, but only one pair was formed, from the Turkmenistani male Alus and the Iranian female, Sherry. Formation of this pair was difficult. They often fought, and employees had to monitor each individual's status 24-7 and quickly respond to any conflicts. During the period of the estrus cycle, lasting five to seven days, the male can make more than 233 landings, lasting five to seven seconds each, but only about half of them are successful. In the period of attenuation of the rut, the males get tired, and in some cases, even avoid contact. Pregnancy lasts an average of 96 days, after which blind kittens weighing about 400 grams are born to the female. The litter size is usually one or two cubs, in rare cases up to four. The female doesn't leave the newborns and constantly feeds and cleans them. Two to three weeks later, she may transfer them to a new den. At about two months, kittens begin to taste meat, but periodically take mother's milk for some time. When the babies are four to six months old, the female begins to lead them to the prey, having previously dragged it a certain distance if it's not too large. The female may bring small, sometimes live prey to the den, with which the cubs play for some time. Usually, prey is taken by the stronger cub, a male, and only when he's played enough and eaten his fill can the other cub eat. As the cubs grow older, conflicts arise between them. The mother is forced to intervene and rear them in different corners, but these episodes are important for the formation of relationships between the predators in the future. At the age of 12 to 14 months, cubs are already able to kill a young roe deer or chamois themselves, but they can't yet track down prey and catch it on their own. 
Young individuals learn hunting skills gradually. These include the search for prey, stealing up on it, then attacking, killing, dragging it away and eating it. They acquire communication skills, contacts with peers through the fence, joint maintenance, hunting and behavior of prey, the skills of exploring new territories, finding someone else's prey and markings are now being formed. Of course, one of the most important skills for survival outside the center is a strong instinct in young leopards to avoid humans. During tests, each graduate of the center must evade humans approaching at a distance of 400 to 500 meters, and this includes leaving prey if necessary. At last, the exciting moment approaches. All at the center live and work for the moment a leopard is released into its natural habitat. Leopard was once the most common inhabitant of the Caucasus, and it's time it came home to live here again. The center's work proves that returning the rarest cat in the world to its natural habitat is possible. An original methodology for preparing and graduating has been created, and the center's infrastructure is constantly being improved. Since its foundation, 25 cubs have been born, and 13 leopards have been released into the wild, with a further four being prepared for release. Some graduates of the center have been living independently in the wild for four to six years. A logical and significant event for the program would be the birth of cubs in the wild. The appearance of a new large predator in any territory leads to changes in the distribution of animals and their mutual influence. The aggravation of competition with some species can positively affect the population dynamics of others. The leopard is at the top of the food chain in the endemic flora and fauna of the Caucasus. With its appearance in the region's mountain ecosystem, it personifies the restoration of the natural hierarchy in the world of wild animals and their mutually conditioned relationships. The appearance of a leopard in forest lands leads to stray dogs being wiped out completely and reduces the number of wolves and jackals, which contributes to an increase in the number of ungulates. Preserving the natural habitats of hunting leopards is the main component of its restoration in the south of Russia. So the leopard restoration program in the Caucasus contributes to the preservation of the ecological framework and all other animals and highlights poaching issues and the destruction of their habitats. The leopard will stand for the protection of nature in the Caucasus. Paradoxical as it may seem, the most formidable predator of the Caucasus needs the most guardianship and attention, and it requires multi-level support from the local population. The leopard, with its delicate vulnerability, forces modern society to take a fresh look at regional economic development needs while preserving the opportunities of the natural environment. The return of the leopard to the wild nature of the Caucasus is just the peak of the ecological pyramid. This should be based on financially secure conservation plans and clear compensation mechanisms for animal husbandry, so that every mountain shepherd is aware and proud of their coexistence with the leopard. The return of the predator will certainly mark the beginning of a new milestone in Russia's environmental history. This film is dedicated to the memory of Umar Semyonov. <laughs>